Good morning, church. Hey, it's so good to be with you guys this morning. Turn to someone next to you and just say, hey, I'm so thankful that you're here today. All right, all right. Hey, go ahead and stand and go ahead and join us in worship.
Jesus. We come before you this morning. We sing of your goodness, of your greatness, of your glory. We call you Father. We call you friend. You invite us into all that you are, into all of your presence, into all of your glory. God, this morning, we join the saints in singing of your goodness. All of those that came before us, all of those that come after us, God, we sing of your goodness, of your goodness, Lord Jesus, of your greatness, of, of the moments where your will was done and it was good. God, you are so good. Even in the midst of things that may not look good around us, you are good. Even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances, your goodness is there. Even in the midst of when things look like nothing is going the way we want, your goodness has us held and cradled in your hands. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We praise you that you are good. In the good times and in the bad, you are good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This morning, church, we have a couple of prayer requests. Um, and I want us... I want us to kind of gather together, and I, if, if we can, this is super unplanned, so I apologize. Um, I want us kind of to gather together, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you guys these prayer requests. Um, but that song, uh, Goodness of God, talks about, I will sing of his goodness. I will sing of his goodness. I will sing of his goodness, right? To the point where it's celebrated, right? The goodness of God isn't just remembered. It's not just talked about. It's not just shared. It's celebrated in song. He's so, so good. I'm going to share with you guys these prayer requests, and we're going to go into a moment of prayer, but if we can, can we do it alongside that song? Can we sing our prayer? Can we sing his goodness? Can we sing how great he is and how good he is into these prayer requests of our church? Would you guys do that with me? I'm going to share these with you guys. We do have a praise report, which is absolutely awesome. We have a husband in the church that's been blessed with a purpose-filled new job of outreach and ministering throughout the Bay Area to those enslaved in sex trafficking, the homeless battling addiction, and the lost. Oh, man. Praise the Lord. We have several prayer requests this morning. I want you to take these things. I want you to hold on to them, and we're going to sing God's goodness into them. To heal and protect marriages. To heal and protect finances. As families are taking care of needy family members. For a young child who just came home from heart surgery with a feeding tube. Oh man, for blood cancers, for all cancers. And for overall spiritual health in the body of Christ. In just a moment, I'm going to pray and I want us to be able to do that alongside that song. I want you to take these prayer requests, and, and I'm sure there are many others that have not, have not come in that maybe you're aware of. Maybe you know friends who, who are struggling with things. The prayers of the righteous availeth much, and our God is a God of goodness. He is a good, good God. The Bible says that we as Christians overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The word of our testimony of the goodness of God of what he has done that is so, so good. So if we, if we would be able to, I'm going to pray in just a moment. Would you take these prayer requests and can we lift them up in prayer and in song? Would you do that with me? Thank you. Lord Jesus, we just come before you today. We bring these things before you. We bring them before your righteousness, your goodness, your greatness. These prayer requests of healing, of healing for, for our congregation, of healing for our communities, of healing for our nation, Lord God. Healing for those who share our faith. God, we just lift these things before you. We lift them before you and we sing, we declare. We declare your goodness into these situations. We declare your will be done in them. Not our will as we see fit, but God, your will, which is always good and righteous. And this morning, Lord Jesus, we're going to take these things before you and sing of your goodness. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. I will sing 
of the goodness of God. All my life, will you sing it again? And all my life, you have been faithful. And all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will see of the goodness of God, I will see of the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy, which is new every morning. Lord God, we sing of your goodness. We declare it. We share it. Lord God, you've been so good and so faithful to us. Why would you stop now? So God, because you won't stop, we won't stop singing of your goodness. That all the world may know that every ear would hear of the goodness of our heavenly father, our friend, the one who is called Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. We lift up these prayer requests. We thank you for this wonderful morning, this beautiful weather that we get to take joy in in this day that you have made. Another sign that your goodness surrounds us. So God, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for the way that you're moving. And together as a church, we declare all these things to you and we say, amen. Amen. Say hi to a friend nearby. Don't sit without saying hello. Hey, I said don't sit without saying no, I'm just Well, church, good morning, good morning. Um, we've got an awesome Sunday planned for you today. Um, we want to take just a moment before we get into it to share with you. Um, here at the Hill, we believe that giving is a huge part of our walk of surrender with God. Um, right? Everything that we have is given to us from the Lord. So it's then, it's then not, not our duty, but our privilege to be able to surrender back everything he's given to place it back in his hands, trust him with it, and know that he's going to be a much better steward of it than we would. Um, and to be able to show him, God, I trust you. I trust you with everything you've given me. I trust you with my finances. I trust you with every part of our life. Um, and in that part of your walk of discipleship with Jesus, we have four ways that you can, you can take part of that. Um, you can come visit us in the office in person. You can mail in your check uh, if you've got a check. Um, probably don't mail cash, but you know. Um, you can give online, and then we also have the app, and I know we're doing a couple of changes uh, right now with the app and some of our online platforms, so if you've got questions about it, please come find one of us as staff. We'd be happy to help you guys out, um, but th we've got those four ways. Again, please ask us questions if you've got them, but like I said, we have an awesome Sunday plan for you guys, um, but we also have some pretty cool stuff coming up, so if you wouldn't mind, turn your attention to the screens for this week's announcements. Good morning, church, and welcome to this week's announcements. We're so happy you're here, and if this is your first time, make sure you go ahead and stop by the table in the front with the people so you can get connected. June 30th, we are having baptisms in between services, so if you or you know someone who needs to get baptized or wants to get baptized, please make sure you sign up and be ready to come and celebrate our friends and family who are taking that journey. Our women's retreat is coming up. It's taking place from July 19th to 21st. It'll be taking place at Lake Tahoe, and the cost is $265 per person. If you're interested in joining or attending this special event, please sign up online. Take me with you. All right, and last but not least, July 22nd to the 26th, our kids are going to Kids, kids Camp! camp! So let's please just keep them in our prayers and make sure they're having a great time, enjoying themselves, and getting closer to God. Whoop, whoop. We're going to that too. We're going to that too? Yeah. Cool. I'm ready. All right. Thank you so much for listening to us as we ramble through those announcements. But we hope that you stayed informed and we hope that you enjoyed the message today. We hope to see you next Sunday.
Good morning, church. How are you this morning? Our God is good and his goodness is running after us this morning. Uh, let me just share with you really quickly, if I, if I could, if you'll give me just a moment before we get into our message. Uh, last Sunday, uh, as you know, was Father's Day. And uh, after service, we were made aware of the passing of one of our former pastors that was on staff here. Uh, pastor Ron House was actually the pastor of the Hill Vallejo from 1969 to 1980. Um, and he passed uh, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, in that area uh, just last Sunday. And just wanted to let you know, some of you uh, may have known Pastor House either here at the church or throughout some of his travelings. It said that he traveled to over 70 countries preaching the gospel um, and saw many people come to know who Jesus was. Just months before his passing, I saw him playing a, uh, all I can say is a masterpiece on the piano. Um, he was still praising the Lord up until his last breath. Um, and why I share that with you is because Pastor House uh, left a legacy here at the Hill. Uh, and we are very big on what it means to have a legacy. Uh, we have such an incredible history of being a part of a family of believers that has been here for just shy of 98 years. And over 98 years, we have seen God do some incredible and wonderful things. We've seen literally a city sprout up around this location. Pastor House actually in 1970 dedicated the multi-purpose building, which is the building with the cross on the other side of the plaza. He dedicated that as it opened. And just a few short years later, he actually had this building that we are sitting in today built and the reason why we are able to worship together is because he had the heart that said, I want there to be generations that will worship the Lord here on this hill. And so we are grateful for the legacy that we get to follow. We are grateful for Pastor House and his foresight and his heart to uh, see a church here in Vallejo thrive and flourish. And we are part of that legacy. We are part of that fruit because there are prayers that have been prayed on this hill for generations. And we literally sit in this building because of those prayers that were prayed, and we are so grateful for it. And so uh, if you know uh, the houses at all or if you have any relation to them, uh, we have sent them on behalf of the church our condolences and just uh, let them know our gratitude for the legacy that they have left here for us. Um, today, before we get into uh, the message, let me just uh, let you know about something really awesome that is coming up here in July. Every Sunday in July after our second service, we are going to gather together uh, on our plaza and we are going to just enjoy what we are going to call a Sunday social where we get to just hang out, be together. Uh, we are going to have food options available for you uh, every single Sunday. I believe everything is $5. So you can have lunch for $5. Our very first Sunday uh, is on July 7th, and it is going to be an awesome Sunday because there is a new business that is here in town called Bula Pies Fiji. Bula Pies Fiji, if you didn't know, the, the owners of Bula Pies Fiji are part of our congregation. And uh, they are going to bring their truck out, and we are going to have a good time uh, every Sunday after second service. But join us, make plans to join us, because it is going to be a lot of fun. You are going to have some wonderful food that is going to be ready for you. Uh, today, I want to start out and uh, look at, uh, for two weeks, this idea of being free from sin. Uh, because I believe that uh, many times in life and in the church even, uh, we don't always accurately define things. We, we, we state characteristics and we state uh, results of things that we're trying to define, but when it comes to actually defining the it, we have a kind of a hard time. We have a difficult time trying to help people understand what it is that we're trying to say. And to illustrate that, I was thinking about the time when my kids were younger and there was a game that we would play. It's a game that's been around for a very long time that uh, admittedly we used to play a lot more when the kids were younger than we do now. But every now and again, and again we bring it out. It's a game called Taboo. Have you ever heard of the game Taboo? It has the wonderfully annoying buzzer that whoever wields its power gets to have more fun than everybody else playing. 
In case you don't know the game, the idea of the whole game is to have a card and you're trying to describe and define a word and trying to get your team to actually guess the word that you're trying to describe and define. But the problem is that you have certain words that you can't use to define that word. And what ends up happening is you have somebody from the other team that's standing over your shoulder with this buzzer that any time you hear a word that is on that list of words that can't be used to define that word, it's a taboo word, and they get to ring a buzzer at you. And I'm the guy that's always up in your ear if I'm the one that's judging whether or not you are saying a taboo word. And sometimes I'll just buzz you just because it's fun to buzz you. And maybe that's the reason we don't play it quite so much anymore because I just sit there with the buzzer all day long just buzzing it because if they gave it to me. I don't play an instrument. This is the closest that I'm going to get to playing an instrument. And so I'm going to sit there as long as I can buzzing you because it's so much fun to do that. And while it's a fun game to play, I found that oftentimes in life and actually even in the church, we use words and language to describe something. But rather than fully describe it, we end up describing the characteristics or the results of what it is that we're trying to describe or define in the first place. And we don't always accurately define the word that we're actually trying to talk about. And today I want to share with you a word that I think has oftentimes gotten lost because we've, rather than trying to define the actual word, what we've done is actually defined characteristics and things instead of the actual thing in and of itself. Are you following me? And today, if you were in Sesame Street, you would say today's word of the day, or it was brought to you by, the word for today is the word sin. See, we talk a lot about sin, being free from sin, that Jesus died for our sin, that he paid the penalty for our sin, but we don't always do a good job of actually defining what the word sin actually is. Because in the process of trying to define the word, we end up stating actions and byproducts that happen as a result of sin, not what actually sin is. And a lot of times when we're trying to talk to people, we come up to them and we tell them, Jesus wants to save you from your sin. And they say, well, what is sin? And we say, well, here's a list of things. And those are actually characteristics and byproducts, but not actually sin in and of itself. Because I believe that scripture actually teaches us what sin is. And it's important for us to have a good understanding of what the definition of sin actually is. It's important for us to have an accurate definition and to understand it. But in order to understand it and define it, we have to actually grab hold of what it actually is. Why do you think it's important for us to define sin? And why does it matter that we have an accurate understanding of it? I believe because we will never have a full appreciation and grasp of the heaviness, necessity, and the beauty of the cross of Jesus without properly understanding how ugly sin actually is. We have to actually understand what it means and what it entails in order to actually look at the cross for all that it really is. You see, oftentimes we look at the cross and we're like, yes, it's the cross. Yes, Jesus died on it, but we don't really take the heaviness of what that actually meant because we don't take the ugliness and the grossness of sin to its deepest understanding. We talk about it on a surface level. And so in other words, sin is a big deal for us to understand because it can help us to actually understand God better and it can help us gain an appreciation of his love for us just a little bit more and it can help us to grow in our relationship from him because when we actually know and understand what sin is, we can actually understand how to be free from it. We can actually understand how we can move closer to God as opposed to being separated from God. And sin is actually something that we all share. It's our human condition. It's what leads to brokenness. It's what leads to pain. It's what leads to shame and darkness in our lives and in this world. And so we have to take a moment to stop and understand what sin actually is. And so to look at what sin actually is, we're going to look at the book of 1 John today. And if you have your Bibles with you in a moment, uh, they're going to put the passage up on the screen, but we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 3 today. 
We're going to be reading out of the NIV translation in just a moment. But before we get there, let me just share with you what was actually going on when John wrote this letter to this church that he knew. John was writing a letter to a group of individuals who were kind of going through it. Anybody ever gone through it? Just a little bit. You've kind of, kind of had a moment in your life. Maybe you've even had a moment in the church with a brother or a sister. Just me? But John is writing to this group of believers, and what was going on was there was a group in the church where they used to fellowship together, they used to be together, they used to break bread together, and hang out together, and they would proclaim Jesus together. And then all of a sudden, something happened. There was a group that broke off from the main group, and they said, you know what? We're not actually sure that we believe in this Messiah thing. We're not actually sure that we believe in this whole Jesus thing. But we do believe that there is a God out there, and you know what? We know him, and you don't. And so... We're going to actually treat you as if you know nothing because we've been so enlightened and we know actually about this God and you don't. And all this, this nonsense that you talk about Jesus, you can, you can keep that because that's not really enlightenment. And so we're going to break away from you and we're going to treat you as less than because you don't know as much as we do. Have you ever, don't, don't answer that. And yet you had this other group that was remaining in the church, holding true to their confession, holding true to understanding who Jesus actually was, what he said and what he did. But the group was shaken because their friends had deserted them. Their friends had walked out on them, those that they had shared life with, those that they had broken bread with, those that they had considered their people had turned their backs on them and walked away. And not only did they walk away, but they began to even ridicule them. And you have this group of believers that are left and they're thinking, what next? Now what do we do? Where do we go from here? And John writes to them on how to deal with what it was that they were going through. And here's what he says in 1 John chapter 3. And he begins by saying this, see what great love The Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning, and no one who continues to sin has either seen him or know him. Dear dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil. Ouch. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. And they cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. And this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and their sister. You see, before John ever gets into discussing what sin is, he takes a moment and he pauses and he reminds us of how great a love the Father has lavished on us by sending Jesus on our behalf to bring us in so that we could be reconciled back to God so that we could know that we are God's children. Because there's something that happens when you know whose child you are. There's something that happens inside of you when you know that's, that's my dad. That, that's, 
don't talk about my dad. That's my dad. Something that happens inside of you. And he says, because of what Jesus has done, you are now called children of God because that is how God has demonstrated his love for you. He's lavished his love on you. He's poured out his love on you by sending Jesus for you when even you were far away from him and you were still stuck in your stuff and in your sin. He sent Jesus so that you could be called a child of God. So before we talk about sin, know just how much God loves you. Because he's lavished his love on you. And he says, if you've received that lavish love, then you and I should be purifying ourselves so that we can remain in the love that God has poured out for us. And so he's trying to remind us, hold fast. Stand firm to the love that God has given you. Because in just a moment, I'm going to talk to you about what it means when you do not hold on to that love that God has for you. And here's what he says. He says, now that you've done that, you will purify yourself. He says this. He gives us our definition of what sin actually is. He says in verse 4, he says, sin is lawlessness. And for a moment, we have to pause and say, well, that's a really heavy statement. Yes, it is. Sin is a heavy and big deal. And so if you want a definition of what it is, there it is right there. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is living in a state of rebellion against God's perfect law. It's a heart that is in rebellion towards God. It's saying, God, I know that you've poured out your love for me, but I don't really care because I want to do my own thing. And God, I'm going to turn away from what it is that you've poured out on me because I want to live in what I like to do. And I don't care about your perfect law. I'm going to turn away from it. It's a heart that's in rebellion. And when our hearts are in rebellion, that is when we manifest that rebellion by all the things that we do that we try to actually define what sin is. When we try to say what is sin, most of the time we're going to give you a list of actions and things that people do and say that's sin. When in reality, that is just the byproduct, that is just the manifestation of something that's inside of our hearts. Sin is actually a state of our heart, not so much an action that we do. But the actions come from what is inside of our hearts. And our hearts, when they are turned away from God's perfect law, when our hearts are turned away from the lavish love that God has given us, what happens is we end up living in our sin and in our rebellion. And when we try to medicate our hearts through things that are contrary to God and the life that he offers, that is when we get the list of things that we try to point out sin as. When in reality, sin is just the condition of the heart that we have that is turned away from God and his lavish love for us. Sin is actually something that separates us. Sin is what separates us from a holy God which ultimately leads to our slow and sometimes our quick spiritual death. Oh, it's heavy this morning. I know it's, it's, it's hard. I know. See, because we have to understand that sin cannot stand or be in the presence of a perfect God, which means that you and I cannot remain in our sin which means that you and I cannot have a heart that is turned away from God. Forget all of the actions and all of the things that we do to try to medicate and all the the list of things that try to be what, what we say is sin. Forget about that for just a moment because behavior changes when our hearts change. I'm not worried and we're not worried and I don't believe God is worried about our behavior so much as he's worried about our hearts because our behavior will follow our hearts. And our hearts have to be turned towards him because his perfect love for us has been poured out through the blood of Jesus. But the only way for us to be removed from our sin is not through anything that we can do. See, we've, we've tried to live our lives in such a way that say, I'm going to live and I'm trying to make myself better by medicating the sin and the things that are going on in my heart by adding things into my life when God has said, I've already provided what you need to have your sin removed from you. 
then the only thing that can remove your sin and my sin is the blood of Jesus itself. There is nothing else that can wipe us clean. There's nothing else that can make us whole. It's only the blood of Jesus that can do that. And yet oftentimes, we try to do things to try to turn us and, and, and heal us and make us whole, and they end up breaking us even more. Why? Because those things are contrary to the law and the life that God has called us to live. And when we live in that way, what ends up happening is we turn away farther from God rather than running closer to him. And we find ourselves at the end of ourselves looking for the one that we've been running away from in the first place. And the only way to have that done is to accept the fact that Jesus paid the penalty for our lawless hearts. Jesus is the one that paid the penalty that made our hearts clean. He is the only one that could remove the death that we so deserved and give us life in its place. He is the only one that could give us the mercy which leads us to living an eternal life with Jesus now and forever. It's only what Jesus did. And that's why he, it says that he appeared to destroy the works of the devil, which is to do whatever he can to separate us from God by trying to entice us to have a heart that is in lawlessness and entice us to do things that will push us away from God because the enemy of your soul does not want you close to God because he knows when a person's life has accepted the blood of Jesus. He knows when a person has received Jesus in their life, when they receive the lavish love of the Father, they know that who their dad is and they will not walk away from their dad because when you become a child of God, something changes and all of the things in our heart that we've been longing for are healed and made whole. And yes, sometimes it's a process, but everything that we need is found in the presence of the Father. And so the enemy says, I will try to put something in front of them that will separate them, that will put their heart in a state of lawlessness and rebellion because that's the way that he lives, is in rebellion and not in law towards God's perfect law. He said, I'm better than God, so I'm going to push every one of his children away from him because I don't want them to know what freedom is I don't want them to know just how good God actually is see because I believe the devil knows how good God is but he thinks he's better and he thinks he has got it better but I've looked at the end and his future is not very good And the future of those that follow him, it doesn't look very good. But when you choose to be a child of God, it says that you get to spend eternity in his presence, not separated from him, but you get to live with him with all of the junk that is in our heart removed from us. And so how do we know that our hearts have been removed from that rebellious state? Look at the fruit of our lives. You see, if sin leads us to do these things, then being a child of God and receiving the lavish love of God will look like this. And I can list it for you, but I want you to read this. And I want you to find it and discover it. Because it lays out what a life that is against God looks like. And it lays out what a life that loves God looks like. And it lays out what the fruit of one versus the other looks like. And so the issue isn't what we do, it's where our heart is. It's the state of our hearts. Are we following God's standard? Are we choosing to live by what he has already spoken? All of it? Not just the parts that are easy? Or the parts that we like? I don't like that page. There's something better on this one. Are we living by everything that he says? Because this is his standard. All of it. And are we in turn loving our brothers and our sisters? Or do we think that we are so much more enlightened and better than them? That we treat them like garbage. Because they're living in a part of their life where they're trying to work out their salvation. They're trying to work things out. Listen, I'm not saying that we 
say that what people do is good. What I'm saying is, are they living their life towards the standard and only God can judge that? In the meantime, my responsibility is to love them and say there is a kingdom that God has sent his son Jesus for so that you could be a part of that kingdom and I don't want to see you stuck in your mess and in your garbage anymore and the only reason I know that you're still in your garbage is because you're still doing these things and God wants to do these things in your life. He wants you to be free he wants you to be walking with your head high because you've been made whole. Not still dealing with the same stuff you dealt with. And once we realize that our sin is so ugly and so gross that it cannot stand in the presence of God, we gain such a greater appreciation and gratitude for the cross and the person of Jesus. Why? Because when we recognize that he was beaten unrecognizable because of our sin, we recognize that he was beaten unrecognizable so that our sin would be unrecognizable. So that our perfect and just God would no longer see our sin, but the one who carried our sin Amen. in our place. So that he could deposit his perfect love and law in our hearts so that we might live in his love and not live in our rebellion any longer. So that you and I could be called his children because one that has his law in their heart will not continue to sin. You notice what I did not say. One who has the law in their heart, the perfect law of God in their heart, I did not say they will not struggle. Because on this side of eternity, we still will have our struggles. We still will have our battles. There is a very real enemy that will stop at nothing than to separate you from God's presence. But one who has the love and the law of God residing in their hearts will not remain in their sin. And there is a big difference between sin and struggle, but let's stop calling sin a mistake and let's call it what it is. It's a heart that is turned away from God. It's a rebellious state that we live in. But see, when we've accepted the love of Jesus, we will learn how to flee from sin. We will learn how to stand firm when the enemy tries to shake us because he will try to shake us. We will learn how to stand firm when the troubles of this life try to overwhelm us and tell us, see, your God actually is not that good. But last time I checked, God's goodness still followed me even in the struggles of life. I just have to open my eyes to see it. Because when I see it, I recognize that he is my father. And he has loved me so much that he sent his son to bear the weight of the sin of my rebellious heart. He sent his son to bear the weight of that so that I could be in his presence again. It's all about him showing us his love. But we just have to receive that love and choose to say, God, I'm no longer going to allow my heart to be in rebellion towards you, but I am going to live my life like I actually believe that you love me. Like I actually believe that you did send Jesus. I'm not going to be like those that John was writing to that says, no, nah, forget about that Jesus. He doesn't work. No, I know my Jesus has proven himself with scars and nails and a love that is everlasting for me. And so I will turn my heart towards him and away from the things that try to pull me away from him, away from the things that try to separate me from him because the absence of God in our life is darkness and pain and shame and hurt but the presence and the gift of God is an eternal life that begins right now. So as we close this time looking at what sin is, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. 
because I want us to take a moment and as a church together, I want us to pray. You see, normally during this time of a service, sometimes if you've been in church, you might be asked if today you want to receive that. But today what I want to do is I want all of us to pray together that we will receive the lavish love of the Father for us. That we would receive just how good he is and that we would turn away from the lawlessness that is in our hearts. And so today I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes and I'm going to ask you to repeat after me because as I mentioned at the very beginning, you see sin is the condition of all of our hearts. And we need Jesus to set us free because the only way that we can be free is through the reception of that blood covering our lives. So as we go to prayer today, would you repeat after me? Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. He is the demonstration of your love. Today we receive the blood of Jesus over our life that will cleanse our lawless hearts so that we can be called your children. Today we turn away from our sin and turn towards the love of the Father because we desire to be your children. Holy Spirit, take control. Direct us, lead us, guide us, walk with us as we turn from sin and towards you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Today, as, as we go, we're going to have people that will be up here to pray with you. If you need to let something go, you need to lay something down. Today, this is a perfect place to do that. But go in the peace and the love of God and live like you, you have received that love in your life. God bless you. Bro.